Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another segment of ASAF Cafe. I am your host, ASAF Adonai. ASAF Cafe is a musical show where every week I invite a guest, and then um, I talk to the guest, and I play the piano at the same time. And the show we did a while ago, part one of this show, my guest, Heather Stone, she's here with Chateau, her service dog. I <laughs> got it right yeah. this time. <laughs> And so we're going to start out again with our familiar Bert Bachrock theme song to this cafe. You've probably, probably heard this song a lot today. But I don't mind because, like, like I said, you play it so beautiful. Thank you, Heather. like the perfect song at the time when I picked it. So if I ever get on Letterman or something, they'll be playing this. <laughs> well, Letterman ends in June, so that's probably Well, maybe not Letterman, but whoever the feature host will be. guys in love with you <laughs> so that's probably going to be my theme song throughout my career they'll be like ladies and gentlemen it's ASAP and I they'll be like da 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 <laughs> da well, da like, da um, Danny Thomas didn't you tell me you met him yes I met him yeah, once Danny yes. Boy was his theme song mm -hmm. actually you know what the name of that song is it's real name it's called the London Derriere I guess actually you've heard that like in the last few months when I was researching something on Make Room for Daddy. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Make Room for Daddy, I just saw it on television on the computer just yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, they, whoever, I don't know whoever owns the rights or whatever, whoever, who, somebody posted the entire series on YouTube. The entire series? Yes. Seasons 1 through 10? I believe so, yeah, because I saw season Whoa. 8. I was looking at an episode of season 8. Okay, well, Mean TV has seasons 5 through 10, I think. Okay. But they always start with season five of his new wife. They don't show the first four seasons with the original person who played his wife. Oh, I see. Well, I don't know. I didn't check all the seasons on there. So that would be exciting because on, even on DVD and VHS, there's only like three episodes that were ever released with the first wife. They play something like that on the yeah. Danny Thomas show, kind of jazz it up a little bit. Yeah. Well, again, it was with the um, Hagen Spencer band. Mm hmm. But anyway, um, its proper title is The London Derriere, and it was known as Danny Boy. And of course, since the actor's named Danny Thomas, right. that was an appropriate theme song. Yeah. And so with me, I think this guy's in love with you. <laughs> it's just something about that song and my personality or I guess me playing the playing on the piano, it just seemed like the perfect uh, theme well, wait, song. Yeah, I'm in love with my piano. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so theme songs are awesome. interesting. And some songs some songs seem to follow people. You know, like famous people. Yeah. You ever notice that? That's the, I guess that's like their theme song. Well, it's song. what they're associated with, especially if it's like came from a TV show or something. Yeah, or a television show, or the name is associated with a hit or something like. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what Paul Schaefer we were talking about in the first one. He used to always play a little bit of whatever they were most mostly known for. Mm-hmm. Right. 
Doc Severson, he did the same thing when someone would come out, you know, like mm -hmm. James Gardner. They would play the theme from the Rockford Files. That is even correct, though yeah. It was now like the 80s and he was out to promote a Hallmark movie. They didn't play anything from the Hallmark movie. They played uh -huh. what people know him from. That's pretty cool, though, if you uh, get a theme song. I oh, think. yeah. So immediately this guy's in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I even played that on my Lawrence Welk show, too. This guy's in love with you. Right, but you didn't choose that for the theme. No, I didn't, because that was different. We, we had to have a fanfare. But for this cafe, um, it works. So. And, of course, if I do interviews in future talk shows, it'll work. Um, and speaking of theme songs, you familiar with the comedian Don Rickles? Yes. Well, you know, but you want to be careful because you said no cussing. And no, no, I'm not gonna. No, I'm not gonna do that. I just want to talk about the theme song. Oh, okay. I was gonna say he's known for saying very. Yeah, no, no, no I wasn't gonna talk about his humor. I was just talking about the theme song. Um, it's like, don't set me up, Asa. No, no, his uh, his theme song is the La Virgen de la Macarena. Oh yeah. You know it as the bullfighter song. Yeah, I was so gonna say So every time he comes out, it's something like this. Yep. that over right. and over. But that does that sounds very strange to me not hearing it on a piano. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I think you've that's got a, a, that trumpet or something. Yeah, you have to have a trumpet yeah. uh, a trumpet <laughs> to make it really uh, <laughs> But uh, I from my understanding of how that became his theme song, it had something to do with the type comedy he was doing in the past. He's known for well, you know, insulting yeah people yes. <laughs> and I don't know if he chose that song or somebody chose that for him during a concert that he did once right but somehow that La Verhen, La Verhen de la Macarena became it fit synonymous it. with Don Rickles yeah. <laughs> and even now he's what like in his 80s now when you see him on the late night yeah. shows he comes walking out really slow and they're like dun, well, he used to go Craig Ferguson like once a year Craig Ferguson loved having him on you know, yeah like, and they he, always play that know, he'd be song. like this is a collision you know <laughs> a living legend <laughs> uh huh <laughs> so yeah um, but Certain theme songs, like I said, seem to work for some people, so yeah. it's kind of cool. Or like when you hear like the theme from Dallas, the old TV show, you know, you always think of Larry Heyman right off. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Oh, you hear the theme from I Dream of Janie. It's like theme songs just bring back, guess a few notes, you know, guess bring back lots of memories. Uh huh. And then sometimes when you watch the show, you go, gee, the theme song was better than the show. <laughs> yeah. I, I am playing the girl from Ipanema. And where I would I know it. that from? I played it for you before. Okay. But anyway, getting back to those theme songs, yes, uh, it's interesting that some people seem to have theme songs that follow them everywhere they go. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> That's a silly thing to talk about, but I just wanted to just kind of bring that up because we were talking about my I own know. theme songs. So. I don't think it's a silly thing to bring up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I like that this guy's in love with you. It's pretty cool. You know, it's just like Anton Fig will always be associated with drums. Oh, you yeah. know, if he came out and played a different instrument, people would probably go, what the heck, you know? And, yeah. uh -huh. Oh, when Johnny Carson would let Doc Severson do a solo, you know, he played a trumpet excellently, you know? But yeah. if you told him to sit down on the piano, it'd be like, you know, people would actually probably be disappointed because you want to hear them play what you know them yeah, best was your, for. Yeah, do you remember a singer named Patula Clark? Have you ever heard of her? No. She did a song called Downtown. Oh, I know that. That was in the 60s. Oh, I definitely know that. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the f for 
first show we were talking about how people would promote the music before YouTube and all that. Mm -hmm. We met American Bandstand. I wish I had been around for that in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that. I bet she was on it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I missed a few notes. I haven't played that in a while, but um, the point I'm making with Downtown, Petula Clark made that song famous, and she once came to Sacramento years ago. She did an outdoor concert at the K Street Mall, the downtown Sacramento area, and they had like a, it's an outdoor mall. Like know? no street traffic? Yeah, it's like the buildings, are, it's literally outdoors, everything's outdoors. I okay. mean, yeah, they got the buildings like the Southgate Mall here, yeah. but it's outdoors, literally outdoors. So uh, it's hard to explain, but... Like you're outside before you, when you go into different stores instead of indoors, like in the mall, the traditional mall. Well, you mean like out, out, like out on Reserve Street? Yeah, it's like every, all the buildings are out. You're outside, and when you go to different. Yeah, well, sections. like if you you, you come out of Target, and then you have to like walk across. Yeah, or or, or go to... next door to like the next door, yeah. but it, it didn't have a roof in the sense of covering like the the mall that we have here. It was okay. considered an outdoor mall. And Petula Clark did a concert there, and she packed, she packed them all. <laughs> and you know why everybody was there to see her. Downtown. To sing downtown. And she waited to around the end of the program, and she did not disappoint. <laughs> she did this extended, long version. Oh, Tina Turner gave a really good live show, mm -hmm. I always heard. Who's that from Tina Turner? On it. <laughs> Let's stay together. Oh, I guess not. Tina Turner did this song. You recognize it? No. But she probably did it with words, right? Yeah. Anyway, this is a little piano version. But yeah, um, Petula Clark didn't uh, disappoint. And like you said, you're talking about Tina Turner. Um, that's called Let's Stay Together. I could have played that a lot better, but it's it's really like a little like a rock and roll love song, oh, I that's guess, what, is the way to describe it. When you stump me, it's because you play the songs, you know. It sounds so different from what I'm used to the... Well, yeah, playing. because... Uh, you know, I play the piano, so... Yeah, I know. <laughs> but when you're like, you recognize this, it's like I'm trying to remember the words, I'm trying to think, you yeah. know, is it being played with a different instrument? Mm -hmm. But downtown, that, that sounds like yeah. downtown, but other songs sound so different when they're played with a different yeah. instrument. Oh, minus the words. So. Uh -huh. Oh, they add words. I was trying to, oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, I'm trying to think of a famous Barry Manilow song, and I cannot. Oh, it, well, um, it used to be a country song that Garth Brooks did, and then he did it as a love song, and it still didn't take off, but then this pop group in London did it with a beat and everything, and mm -hmm. now it became kind of like, you talk about songs that follow people, he yeah. always, people always expect it to be in his live concerts. <laughs> uh-huh. And well, even he said he never ever thought about playing it as like Take Six did. Uh huh. You know, and then he had to get permission to do it their version. You know. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. Because <laughs> after so many years, songs become what's called public domain, and anybody can use them. Right, but he wanted to do it like yeah. right away. Right, the modern. You had to get permission then, most likely. Yeah. And usually, if you're someone famous, and you go to another famous person, they usually say yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Garth Brooks said yes to him doing it as a love song. Mm-hmm. You know, and he's like, oh, see, it didn't work for you like it didn't work for me. <laughs> and then Take Six did this version, and I was like, whoa, that's the same song, you know. And right. for, you know, someone as famous and well-musicioned to take notice of that, you know, that, mm -hmm. wow, they changed my song and they actually made it where people really like it. Yeah. Um, 
But getting back to famous people, uh, I did see Doc Severson in concert once. Yeah, I remember you telling me that. Yeah, he uh, came to the uh, Sacramento State Fair years ago, and it was an outdoor concert. <laughs> they well, do everything the outdoors. <laughs> they do everything outdoors in Sacramento these days. And it was a huge uh, stage, and there was maybe hundreds of people there. And they did two shows, yeah. and Ed McMahon was there. For real. So it was just like watching the Tonight Show live at that Without time. Without Johnny. <laughs> you just didn't have Johnny there. <laughs> but um, they did that kind of music, and Doc Severinsen, he was just in top form. And what was interesting about that concert is, uh, I have to describe this. There was a, he, we, you know how he, he was known for wearing these strange outfits? Well, not strange. I thought he was... Loud for, color. Yeah, I was going to say colorful. Yeah, like colorful. Me. Well, he had this one shirt. Uh, and it had these beads that went all the way down to the ground from the tip of his hand all the way to, oh. the, to the end of well, his shoulder. Well, don't they make country shirts or jackets that have the fringe that goes? Yeah, like? but this particular one literally went all the way down to the ground on both sides. <laughs> so when he picked up his trumpet and was playing, uh, you could see these beads like flopping around on his shirt and it looked way cool. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> he's like their dad's playing. I thought you were going to say the beads started hitting each other. Well, no, it, it just it was like a material uh, shaped like little beads, not you know literal beads. I don't think just the, okay. the, the, the material, and it, it literally went down to the ground. So when he was moving around playing his trumpet and shaking his stuff, it looked way cool. It was like, well, so you need to get some costumes then. <laughs> yeah, well, he did. He had a lot of different uh, costumes for that concert. So they did two shows, and. Um, it, obviously, it was the same show, obviously, just a different audience. So, <laughs> I went to both shows. Well, why not? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was part of the fair that I paid uh, when I went to the state fair at that time. Yeah. So, um, it was a delight to see Doc Severinsen. And uh, I saw Petula Clark. I haven't got to see very many famous people in concert over the years. And then I saw James Brown in concert once, oh, too. Oh, I, I bet he put on an awesome show. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Let's have fun with James Brown. I know supposed to represent him screaming. Yeah. <laughs> I figured that out. <laughs> so I saw him at concert. No, he did not disappoint. And you know what was funny about watching his concerts? Uh, you probably know this. Somewhere in the middle of his concert, he'd start crying, right? And he just No, drops. I didn't know that. Well, it's staged, obviously. Oh. And uh, he would get down to his knees with a mic in his hand. He'd be like crying. <laughs> you know, like singing and stuff. And this guy would come out with this cape. This big long cape like Superman's all fancy, like Liberace or something. Okay. It was a big fancy cape. And the guy would put the cape on James Brown and all of a sudden he'd pop up, just he'd just jump up on the stage and start singing again. Okay. Oh that <laughs> I know that doesn't make much sense, but it was fun to uh to see that. That's what that was one of a trademark that they did. Um in those concerts of his when he was okay. getting a little bit older. But yeah, he would do a lot of dancing and singing and screaming and <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So the name of that song I just played is uh I Feel Good. Like they knew that you were Yeah, that's the name of it. I feel good. James Brown. And of course, 
I can't sing like that, obviously. Right. <laughs> and so when I do these piano versions of these songs, they're just classical piano versions. Right. Because that song is a lot more forceful. Well, yeah. <laughs> you get a band behind you. <laughs> and you could do that, you know. <laughs> But, um, well, you got an extra wall and a fireplace, and so maybe you'll get a band next. <laughs> yeah, who knows. Maybe we do season three or four, <laughs> and I don't know. Since this is based on Casablanca, let me play that um, as time goes by. Okay. Oh, a kiss is just a kiss. Yeah. As time goes by, it's his real title. They said that movie was in the film Casablanca. Well, and of course, there were other people who sang that song too. Yeah, because I was going to say, it's funny, I know that song, and yet, I, like I said, I don't think I've ever really sat through the whole movie. Yeah, well, it, they probably took that song and just played it on the radio or whatever they did at the time. So, And a singer named Peggy Lee, I don't know if you would know her or remember her, she used to mm -hmm. sing that song a lot too. Okay. Peggy Lee. Um, Well, for the people in your generation, she's probably going to be remembered for singing a song called uh, He's a Tramp from Lady and the Tramp, the Disney cartoon. Oh. Remember that song? He's a tramp, he's a scout. Oh, and yeah, I love there it. you go. Well, the lady that's saying that her name was Peggy Lee. Because I guess I had that on like in the last month, and I'm like, yeah. okay, well, I had to think where in the movie was that song. It was a scene when Tramp was locked up in that doggy jail or whatever it was. Yeah, and she found out that he had many, many, many girlfriends. Yeah, so she was singing that. <laughs> and um, that was Peggy Lee. And she was also known for singing a song called Fever. It went something like this. Have you ever heard it? Well, anyway, the name of that song is called Fever. Okay. And uh, that was one of her big hits, too. Well, she did a lot of stuff. She sang with Sinatra. She sang with everybody in, oh. in the music world. Oh, that might be world. why I'm not so familiar with her. Yeah, well, she in her heyday, she was in the, in the 1940s, early 40s. She sang with Benny Goodman. And okay. Of course, she, I wasn't even alive then, so I know about it through history. <laughs> so that's kind of her, uh, her era. And then when they did Lady in the Tramp, they got her to do that. But um, she did a lot of hits, like, Is That All There Is? I think that was one of her big hits. She did a song called Alley Cat. She did the song, uh, I'm a Woman. You know the one that goes, I can cook the bacon and be home by 9 o'clock because I'm a woman. Okay. <laughs> and something like that. <laughs> that must have been during the feminist era. I don't know. But I don't know if those are the right words, but okay. she did that song. And um, the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, there was a scene where Tula. Tula was singing that song in the film. She had just went out on a date with Eon. I'm not familiar with the movie. Did you no. never saw the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding? No. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> that, that is my personal all-time favorite film of all time. Even over Casablanca? Yes. Oh. I okay. mean, of every movie that was ever made, the Star Trek series, everything, that, that is my uh, personal. I didn't know you were a 
a Trekkie. Oh, yeah, I remember when Star Trek first came out. Well, I remember it in reruns, but I was... No, in... I mean, I, I remember when it actually came out. Oh, yeah, television. I know, because we got <laughs> about 20 years on it. Yeah, something like that. But anyway, um, my parents lived in Virginia at that time, and um, so Star Trek came on Friday nights. And so my parents used to let me and my brother stay up just to watch it. And uh, that's how I became a Trekkie, you might say. Yeah. Because I mean, they always say those Trekkies and those Star Wars fans, but it was like not a mix of both. Yeah, well, it was on regular television. It came on every Friday night at uh, 9 o'clock in the part of Virginia we lived in at that time. Yeah. Um, well, at that time, it was considered kind of controversial, you know, having. Yes, it was. So it was going to have the latest time slot of the night. Yes, it was. It was controversial, and it was up against all the westerns like Gunsmoke and so on. And yeah. It's supposed to be like a wagon train to the stars. Well, that's what they also said about Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. Now, I, I didn't particularly care for Battlestar Galactica. Now, see, I, I liked the original one. I couldn't one. get into that one. But. I liked Battlestar Galactica and Buck Rogers. Mm -hmm. I did not like the new Battlestar Galactica at all. Okay. I mean, in my opinion, Cylons are supposed to be big, brainless robots that you should be afraid of, mm -hmm. not uh, robots that look like humans who can have sex with you. Well, <laughs> that was a good okay. well, I didn't see that, so I'm not going to go well, there. That's why I was like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> but mean, it, some things should not be remade, and that's one of them. <laughs> that's interesting you said it about films. Um, they, they're, you know, when they make a film, they should leave it alone. Like when they did the uh, Superman movie with Christopher Reeve, in my opinion, they yeah. should have quit. Instead of making well, they should have quit two, after three and four. Well, I was gonna say they should quit after two. <laughs> three and four was so yeah, odd. Pretty lame. It's bad. By the time they got the number four, that was like really ridiculously lame. As, as yeah. You know? And I mean, I'm not here to pick on the people who made the Superman franchise movie. But no, but sometimes they get greedy and they like don't even care about the script because they think that people will just come to see it because the you know it's part of the continuing saga of whatever. I've never played this song before, but I'm going to do um, the theme. I don't know if it's a theme song to My Big Fat Greek Wedding. It went something like this. Something like this. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty music, but I like that film because um, it talks about two people from two different cultures that eventually meet and marry. So they had to go through oh yeah, Melody the culture. Bride thing. Yeah, they had to something like that. Yeah, they had to do the uh, culture thing, but only they were in the same state in the same city. But it was still two, two cultures. Tula's family was Greek. Okay. And so they lived in this. Uh, Chicago neighborhood, and everybody had the normal houses like we have. There's like the Greek palace, we know what the gods are, the, the statues of the gods. The oh. It's like this Greek palace in the middle of the residential neighborhood. Okay. So everybody thought they were strange anyway. <laughs> and so um, she meets Eon Miller. Well, what, I mean, was this like, you're not talking about like Chicago ghetto then, you're talking like. Well, the nicer uh, affluent uh, Chicago neighborhood. Okay. So everybody has normal, you know, normal houses. The normal houses, but theirs is, looks like a temple. Okay. Their house, so. <laughs> yeah, well, because when I think of Chicago, I thought, when you say normal houses, I've, then, then. Well, not the projects. I'm just talking about, like, the residential okay. neighborhoods. Well, I thought the classic houses were, like, really slender. I'm trying to think if they had a, I think it was an architecture term for them. I don't know. Do it again. Something like that. Lower notes. Oh. 
something like that in the film. Well, that sounds like the end of. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a keyboard too, but it's if you don't if you if you ever get to see that film, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. It's a beautiful film. Okay. It's got some, well, not really language, um, just some overtones like most movies. But, what do you mean by overtone? Um, it has like some little innuendos throughout the film, jokes, innuendo oh. kind of jokes. Not 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 swear words, not that. Just All right. Just little um, words. So, um, but I think it's a I, th I think it's a delightful movie. Or is it like cultural? Yeah, it, it it did cover the cultural parts. Um, both families lived in the Chicago area, in this film, even right. though they were Greek. They had their Greek heritage in Chicago. They were living the Greek lifestyle in Chicago. Right. Uh, Tula's family and um, Ian's family. Uh, his father and grandfather, they were lawyers. So, you know, you, you get the lawyer family and the Greek, and you put them together, and it's there's like this clash at first. Uh, oh, if you say so. Well, I mean, when you, according to the film anyway, but uh, Tula and Ian work it out. They, well, that almost sounds like Romeo and Juliet. Well, sort of, yeah. Only um, they didn't themselves, you know, so, <laughs> but uh, that is my personal favorite film of all time. Okay. I think I got that movie memorized. I've seen it so many times. And there was a scene in there where um, the actor Michael Constantine, he plays Gus, the, the patriarch of the Greek family. He's the father. Okay. He's probably very loud and... Yeah, there was a scene in there where, you know, they're so old-fashioned, they believe that the guy should ask the father first before dating the girl, right? Well, that's tradition. Yeah, but Tula was kind of breaking away from her Greek heritage, so she went out with this guy anyway. She didn't tell her family she's gonna go out with him, and so um, the you know Tula has like a lot of relatives, like twenty seven cousins alone in this film. And then she probably got spotted. Yeah, she got spotted with. Uh, so um, it, there was a scene where um, she gets spotted, and so the the cousin that spots Tula with Eon tells her mother who then calls the mother of Tula's cousin. <laughs> then that second mom calls Tula's mom, and it's spread to the whole Greek family. So what, what year was this made in? Probably about 10 years ago, something like that, maybe. Okay, because, I mean, now they would just post it once, and everybody would get it. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, maybe by now. And so, like I told you, I got it memorized. Um, so finally, Eon is standing in front of the father, and he goes, Sneak around all over Chicago, but you never come here to ask, can you date my daughter? <laughs> and he and Ian goes, well, sir, I, I'd ask you, but she's 30 years old. He goes, I am the head of the house. <laughs> you know, that old-fashioned yeah. kind of. And so Ian says, okay, may I date your daughter? And he goes, no. So Ian says bye to Tully Lees, right? And then talk about male chauvinists, I guess, for that culture. And I'm not picking on the Greek culture. Because I told you I got this memorized, this movie. So then the right. father, Michael Constantine, the actor, he goes in there, and the wife is sitting down, and Tula's sitting down, and he goes, Didn't I say it was a mistake to educate women? Now we got a boyfriend in the house. Is he nice Greek boy? No, no, no. He's ex no with the big long hairs on top of his head. <laughs> ah! And he screams out the door. And so then Tula apologizes to her mother. Maybe I should get a job acting because I got that movie memorized. <laughs> but that's quite a scene though when that father goes off on, on that family like that. So, But it was a cute movie because eventually the father learns to accept the non-Greek because no one in that Greek culture has ever gone out with a non-Greek except for Tula. So... Um, eventually, they get engaged, and it didn't sit well with the father at first. But he. No, learned... but I think the storyline it sounds so familiar. Yeah, and he he eventually accepts it, and uh, then they go on to get married, and they had this beautiful wedding, uh, like Greek wedding, and Eon goes to all the trouble to get the family to accept him. So he goes through a baptism service, Greek baptism. <laughs> And he, he goes through all this other stuff, and then they finally accept him. And then at the end of the film, Gus, you know, Michael Constantine, Constantine's yeah, yeah, character, head. he buys them a house as a wedding gift. And does it have, uh, is it like a Greek palace? Or no, what? it's just a regular house. But <laughs> okay. he, he buys them a house and gets their life started. 
But that's just such a delightful plot line to me. So that's why I like that. And uh, they had, uh, I guess, we, uh, actually a traditional Greek wedding, you know, with a priest. And what was interesting about that wedding scene was Eon's family, there was just a handful of them on one side of the church. And on the other side of the church, all two of those whole family flipped the whole, the whole side of that church. You know, every, just all the pews all just sitting up there with Greek folks and stuff. So, but, you know, Michael Constantine goes way back. He's going to probably be best remembered for a show called Room 222. I don't think you've ever heard of it. I've heard of it, but I didn't watch it. It went something like this. Um... Well, never mind. But, um, yeah, he played... Well, the... you do have to remember, in my childhood, yeah. there wasn't, we didn't have a VCR yet. I didn't have a VCR <laughs> yeah. until I was uh -huh. like... My household didn't have a VCR until we were like 10, so... Right. But, but also, we didn't have cable or anything, but still, you know, what your parents wanted to watch over, took over, you know, whatever you wanted to watch. Mm hmm But, um... Um, yeah, Room 222 was just, a, you know, Michael Constant Constantine played the principal, the school principal. Okay. It was just one of those, sit well, not sitcom, it wasn't a comedy show, it was more like a cross between comedy and serious, and it just talked about the everyday going-ons of the high school at the time, the kids were in high school, so. And I don't know how many seasons it lasted, maybe a couple seasons, something like that. Okay. Because I like... You know, remember, like, Head of the Class and stuff like well, that? Well, no, it wasn't crazy like Head of the Class okay. or any of that. It was more... Room well, 222 like, was probably a little bit more serious. What was that um, Sidney Poitier film where he was... Yeah, To Serve With Love. It wasn't yeah. quite that... Uh, but not that... Quite that dramatic. It was, it, it was a cross <laughs> between To Serve With Love and, and Head of the Class. So we're in the middle there, you know? Well, hopefully it'll show up on MeTV and then I'll know. <laughs> yeah, if you ever hear of a show called Room 222, a young Michael Constantine was the principal, so... And I used to watch Sad's Kid growing up. And, uh, but yeah, they had the perfect actor for my big fat Greek wedding with uh, Michael Constantine. But did you guys get to choose what was on the TV when you were growing up, or did your mom? Well, there were get certain shows that my mother wouldn't let me watch. Such as? Well, if, she, if, if it was a show that she thought a kid shouldn't watch, and of course they didn't have bad content necessarily, yeah. like uh, today. But you gotta remember, I was a little kid too, so. She probably wouldn't let me watch something like uh, maybe certain westerns that might have been a little bit too gruesome. Man, I can't really think of TV westerns. Because they say like the wife woman was one of the most serious westerns, but even then when he killed people, it wasn't gruesome. Well, I don't know if that's the right term, but... Uh... Oh, speaking of westerns, there was one called Have Gun, Real Travel. I remember that one. And someone like for Scott Chateau, I used to say, Have Dog, Real Travel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that went something like this. Uh, let's see if I can pick it out. Hold on. Yep. Something like the that. The Western themes were always so inviting. Yeah, they were just kind of... <laughs> like, you know, you, but then when you read the real historical accounts, you know, it's like, man, no, being in the Western was really hard times. Mm -hmm. But they made them, the themes always, no matter what Western movie, Western TV show, it gets like so romantic. Something like that. Yeah. I think like, that was Out on the trail all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um... But yeah, I used to watch that uh, Western too. But I guess maybe because I uh, was relatively young and sometimes I had to go to bed um, when some of these shows were on and maybe that's why my mom didn't let me watch them because I'd be too sleepy to go to... Well, like you like to play the theme from Secret Agent Man. Now, was that something you watched when you were a kid? Or Actually, I didn't. I did okay. not watch Secret Agent Man when I was growing up. I watched a Batman with uh, the actor. Oh, I wish I was alive doing that because it's amazing how that went so popular and then gets like... Flopped. <gasps> yeah, well, see, the thing is, um, I was in something like the first or second grade when that show first came on regular television at the time. Nelson something Riddle. like that. 
Oh, no, good. You know him. No yeah. surreal. But well, he anyway. did the theme for Emergency, my all-time favorite TV show. Oh, great. And but people know him from Route 66, which I didn't really think was such a great theme compared to Batman and Emergency. Well, I'm impressed that you know who Nelson really is. He was a fantastic uh, arranger, yeah. composer. But um, getting back to um, Adam West, uh, I was in the, either the first or the second grade at the time. And my mom used to send me to bed at 8 o'clock at night. And back then came on at 8. <laughs> So she would allow me to step 30 more minutes to watch it. And then on the nights when she wouldn't let me watch it, my brother and I would just sneak up and peek in the hallway and watch it anyway. So we were just kids. But so she it, would have it on for herself? Yeah. She'd be watching it. <laughs> See, my father was overseas at that time because he was stationed in Pakistan and the, the Air Force wouldn't let me and my mother go. I mean, they weren't blowing people up in those days, but it was still pretty risky. At oh, that okay. time, and my father was just having to be stationed there, so we didn't see him for a whole year and a half. And um, wow. so my mom and I lived with my grandmother. So my grandmother would be doing work at a house. I'm gonna. Mom she would, probably didn't go for the Batman. <laughs> probably not, but my mother did, and I used to plead with my mom. Mom, let me watch Batman. And sometimes she would let me watch him, and sometimes she would. But you know, they they like. I think in the second season they aired them like two nights back to back or whatever. Yeah. So if you missed one, at least you got the recap. So yeah. So you're better off getting part two instead and of part waiting one. a little week when it first came out. Yeah. But you know, like anything else, they run out of ideas what to write about. Yeah. But then Lost in Space, you know, copied them and they end up wrecking their show because they were the most serious show in the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, if they had kept Lost in Space serious. Yeah. I think it would have lasted a lot longer. Me too. And I think the actor Billy Mummy said something like that in an interview once. The actor that played uh, Will yeah, Robinson. Will Robinson. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. That was like a great theme song. Something like that. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> I'm not a trumpet player. The yeah. trumpet players get. Dee, 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 yeah. Well, like when like. we were talking about Green Hornet. Oh, that was cool too. I used to yeah. watch the Green Hornet too. Well, oh. that that was a spinoff from Batman. Yes, it was. was a, yeah, because they guest starred on mm -hmm. a Batman episode, and then they spun them to their show. But that only lasted one season. Yeah. Well, you know, like anything else, people start running out of ideas. Right. But again, that one was more darker than Batman. Yes, it was. It was more serious. I mean, people got murdered so, on the Green Hornet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, not like today. I mean, you just well, no, but I mean the, the implication, you know. Yeah. And of course, there are themes, the uh, flight of the bumblebee. Uh, I can't play it on this thing. I'll do it in slow motion. <laughs> Something like but that. But see, it's recognizable in slow motion on a piano. <laughs> Something like this. Yeah. You're doing great. <laughs> Something, I don't know how to play that, but something like that. Yeah. Then, of course, you know, they play it, like, real fast. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you're right. The Green Hornet was a little bit more uh, serious, I think. Yeah. Is the word, way to describe that. And um, as time went by, they just started making more shows that seemed more relevant, I think, for the time. Like in the 70s and 80s. And well, yeah. Well, then they said television got too violent, like with Coke Jack and... Yeah. Starchy and Hutch came off pretty serious in the, in the first couple of seasons. Yeah, and, and they had a bunch of those kind of cop shows that were really... Yeah, there was one, I can't remember which season it was, but it was one season, it's in the tri tri trivia, one season in the 70s where there was not one Western on the yeah. um, schedule. It was all cop shows and like medical shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the most famous medical show of the past was Medical Center with the actor Chad Everett. I don't know if you've ever heard of that show. I've heard of it, but I haven't seen one. I remember yeah. Marcus Welby, MD. Yeah, well, that was more family, not family-oriented, just more of a, it seemed more a family medical doctor, whereas Chad Everett was more serious, like he, like your brain would be hanging out of your head, <laughs> and be trying to fix it, <laughs> so, that's and an exaggeration, it that, no, oh. that was an exaggeration, just okay. to give you an idea how, because I remember when Chicago Hope came on, everyone said, oh, it's too graphic, well, no, it wasn't graphic, it was just, yeah. you know, um, Dr. Gannon could save everybody, <laughs> I mean, if you, like, got in a car wreck, or oh. plane wreck, and you're, like, half Dismember, he'd be fixing you all up and sending you home by 60 minutes you know, at the end of the episode. <laughs> That's so 
don't show ridiculous. I know, but that was medical center at the time, so <laughs> people like that, huh? Yeah, it will, yeah. Well, he was good looking too. Chad Everett was a very handsome. Yeah. But I bet he kept his shirt on. Yeah, he did. See, That's I like it was. in the old days when people could actually be, be considered very good looking, and yet they aren't undressed. You no, know? they didn't do that in those days. Yeah, um, so I mean, I always. It's like, why do we have to do it now, <laughs> you know? I don't know. I, I can't answer that. I don't, I, I don't run Hollywood. Yeah. But yeah, Chad Everett was very, very, very handsome. Okay. I mean, no, seriously, he really was. And uh, he, he just played that Dr. Gannon perfect. See, I know him from one show, but he was like playing the grandfather. Oh, well, yeah, he's, he's much was older. I mean, he was very Sierra young. Rescue or something like that? Uh-huh. Yeah, Chad Everett, was. he looked like a kid almost in a way. Maybe in his uh, late 20s, I'd say. He's in the medical young. center, you mean? Yeah, he was very oh. young. He was like this genius doctor who can fix anybody. Well, <laughs> all, the other doctor, almost... all the other doctors like a little bit older, right? They just yeah. go to Dr. Gannon. He just... Hey, this well, it sounds Dr. like Gannon. an early version of a uh, Doogie House. Yeah, <laughs> something like that, but he was an adult. So, you know, Dr. Gannon can fix anything. I think they had one episode where somebody passed away. <laughs> and that didn't sit well with Dr. Gannon. Yeah, well, that was like uh, Perry Mason, wasn't there one episode yeah, well, that in 12 episode. years that he lost? <laughs> yeah, well, Dr. Gannon lost one patient in that whole series. So. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was called Medical Center was the name of that program. Okay. And um, no, I don't think they could have found a better actor to play that role than Chad Everett. Oh, wasn't there another one called Ben Casey? Yeah, I don't. I'm not as familiar okay. with that show. Okay, I think that was the competition to medical center. Now well, I think medical that. center was on. I, I I'm old enough to remember that. Okay. I mean, everybody watched medical center. Seriously, everybody did. And, so your uh, mom was okay with you watching the, a guy well, with his brain was, hanging uh, half out? <laughs> well, this was. Uh, they didn't have all that. They didn't show all the gory stuff oh. in medical center like they do today. So. Okay. <laughs> Like you watch ER or something. Oh. <laughs> you might as well just I know, sign up for I feel like I wanted to throw up and I'm not even watching and I'm just listening to all the talk and it's like, oh. Well, Medical Center obviously wasn't as detailed and graphic as uh, ER. Yeah, but well, I the, said ER did not do anything for me because I thought, it's like I don't want to lose my dinner that I just ate. <laughs> yeah, but see, you didn't, when you watch Medical Center, you didn't do that. He just gets in, get in surgery and he had perfect hair and, you know, <laughs> now the hair was out of place and probably sprayed a lot of hair goop on it, you know, before they said, roll it! <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of a fun show to watch and it, it was serious for the time, I guess. Okay. So anyway, I wanted to ask you because we got a, a little. We're going to be we're winding down here pretty soon. Um, how long have you had Chateau? Um, since January of two thousand eight. Great, great. I don't know if you knew me I don't, before not, I had Chateau. No, I don't think so. Okay. I when I when when you and I first met was at that bus station about seven right. years ago, something like that. So I and I have... had just did my piano CD at the yes. time. And I was looking for people at random yes. that liked um, um, piano music. And I saw you standing there, so I walked up to you and I introduced myself, gave you the CD, if I recall. Yeah. Now, that CD, it's still available. Well, it's available on Bandcamp, B A N D Camp dot com. They can download it. I've never heard of that site. It's just a little site where it's a music site, you know, CDs. Oh, okay. Just go to Bandcamp dot com. And the name of the CD is Lean On Me, Jeannie Marie. That's the name of the CD. And uh, the title song is um, Lean On Me, Bill Yeah, Withers, which was me. an awesome song. I was hoping you were going to play that today. Let me do it again. It's been a while since I've done it. Let me do it again.
That's pretty much how I played it on the CD. A little longer version, obviously. Yeah. And of course, it sounds more prettier because I was on a nine-foot concert grand piano when I recorded that. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you gave me the CD, I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll listen to it, you know. And I was not expecting the quality of music and how well you arranged it and everything. I was like, well, thank you. <laughs> you know, I was like, whoa, did I? You know, this is professional. Why is he giving this out for free? <laughs> well, I was just trying to get the uh, word of mouth and the music out at the time, and I just picked. I only gave a, a, a I gave away a few handful of CDs. I just picked persons at random. Wow. And you were one of the people I picked. And I'm glad we got to become friends, but yeah, yeah I, I practiced and prepared for that CD. Well, you can tell. I was, I was prepared at that time. I put a lot of hours in practicing. And when we recorded that CD, I was, on, I was in front of a nine-foot, literal nine-foot concert grand piano, and I had my candelabra on there. And what they did was they raised the top of the piano, and they put a tiny little microphone inside the piano. Ooh. And then they had two big towering microphones, one behind me and one in front of the nine-foot piano. Whoa. And then they had these two computerized uh, mixing boards so that they can balance it out and everything. And that's how come that CD turned out the way it did. It turned out awesome. It took 11 hours to record that CD. Boy, that was a long day. Well, because, see, every time you do one song, then you have to stop and readjust the equipment and everything. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and then if I made a mistake, then we had to stop. That I knew. <laughs> so, and originally there were 25 songs that were recorded in that 11-hour period. So we had lunch in the music room where we recorded it when we took a break. Unfortunately, uh, 12 songs accidentally got lost after all that work. Oh. See, originally how I did was, they get lost? It was a computer glitch or something. Somehow, 12 of the songs just somehow got lost. Oh my gosh. And so the 11 remaining songs that are on the CD that I gave you, that yeah. I uh, had that done. That had to be heartbreaking. Well, it was. It was more heartbreaking, I think, for the engineer because it freaked him out. It, it was just a computer glitch or something. Something happened, and randomly 12 of the songs were gone. Because originally, we were going to do two um, CDs, part one okay. and part two. Right. Oh, and some CDs, they come to guess two Yeah, we would have probably done something like that originally. But uh, the title song, Lean On Me, did not get lost. Thank goodness, because yeah. that is, you play that great. Well, I could play a lot better on a real piano than these keyboards, but, um, and I was prepared. Yeah, put the but hours. I mean, you should be prepared. That's why we were talking about instant fame and 16 <coughs> minutes of YouTube and all that, and uh -huh. I guess don't go for that. Yeah, well, at that time, um, I could probably play better then than I can now because I haven't played in a while, but just to give you an idea, you know. And if I were going to do another recording, I would spend hours practicing to prepare for it again. That's how you do yeah. it. <coughs> Excuse me. Want to drink some of your own juice? I'm going to, yeah, clear my throat. <laughs> but anyway, um, that was a fun project, and it cost me $1,000 to make that CD. Yeah, well, I was going to say you were paying for studio time. Yeah, that was part of it, and um, the mixing time and everything. And um, Did you get some of that refunded since they lost half your songs? No, what happened was I didn't have to pay that $1,000 because I gave music lessons to the guy who recorded it <laughs> for a season, and, uh, and we worked out that arrangement. So He was a professional guitarist, very good at it too, but he didn't know his theory as well as I do. So, you know, we uh, worked out an arrangement. Well, that's awesome. And I taught him how to play... Um, Takata Fugue in D minor, the song, it's not a piano song, it goes something like this. Is he playing electric or good? Yeah, well, uh, combination of both, electric and... It sounded cool on the guitar, you know, when he got to that part. Yeah. Because it would start out something like this. Um... <laughs> That's Sounds like you're walking out. into a mansion. Da -da -da. <laughs> you know, um, something like that. Yeah, but the guitar, guitar solos people love. Something like that, yeah. Well, you know, he did his little stuff on the guitar. And so when it got to that middle part of the song, this part, it was yeah. way cool. Well, they thrive on, like, how fast they can do the chords and everything. Mm-hmm. I 
I'll do it again. Oh, sorry. Something like that. It just goes on and on, you know, right. that little cycle. But on the guitar, it sounds way cool. Yes. <laughs> it was really cool when you hear guitarists. And so I taught him how to play that. I gave him some theory lessons. And And what him. exactly is a theory lesson? You know, like learning the chords the way you should, uh, as far as classical music. Okay. Uh, if I had to explain it, um, you'll learn um, scales, like oh, and chords, yeah. you know. You know, chords and, and, and then all this other stuff that's involved. They call it theory. Oh, okay. And there were certain things he needed to know to be able to do these little patterns, you know. Isn't that pretty? Isn't that pretty? Very pretty. I'm not, I'm not doing it justice, so I'm just... Well, I mean, sometimes because you're, it's so repetitious, but you're like, you keep jumping to a higher yeah. key. Something like that. I like got it right that time. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's called the Takata Fugue in D minor by Johann Sebastian Bach. So if you go in front of a computer or YouTube, you might be able to hear the whole composition yeah it's usually played on an organ okay um and you know the, the organist does the entire thing so when they get to that part they're doing all the other stuff that organists do and you can hear that and so on very well an organ has the extra layer of yeah they have all those extra keys yeah. and those keys on the bottom and they're doing all the other stuff that goes with that song instead of this generic version that i'm doing <laughs> But it still sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it is. And so, he, since he's a guitarist, you know, they can do little rock versions of that, you know, use that in passages. And so, over a period of time, I gave him music lessons and paid off the $1,000 for my CD. Nice. And he produced it, and the rest is history. And of course, you've got a copy of it. <laughs> yep. And uh, eventually, I'm going to maybe one day do a second CD. Oh, that'd be great. And uh, I'll be prepared again by that time. So, uh, did you have fun on this, uh, both of these programs yeah, here? Yeah, I did. Yeah, it's about time to wind down, and okay. uh, it was wa it was nice to have Chateau here. Yeah, Chateau's like, oh. Both of us company. <laughs> Winding down, my favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. So, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is ASAP Cafe, and uh, everything I did today, like the Takata Fugue in D minor, was just impromptu. It's not really a piano song, you know. Right. It's really an orchestra, like, really, organ song. I said sometimes you stump me because it's like I do know the song, but I'm not used to it in piano. For, for you know, Yeah, piano. and I was just picking those notes out at random. I'll probably forget like an hour from now how I did that, so... <laughs> But anyway, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to ASAP Cafe. I am ASAP Adonai, and uh, again, my friend Heather Stone and her her uh, service dog. <laughs> get the right word. Yes. Chateau. <laughs> and Chateau looks great on camera, and uh, you'll get a copy of this show as soon as we wind, wind down. So until our next show, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Heather Stone and myself, Maranatha.